But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I've asked Jason, our band leader, to bring you a greeting. Hello, brothers and sisters. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all. We're really, really honored and really enjoying ourselves being with you, so thank you. Um, the verse that Ray just read is, uh, is a very dear verse to many of us at Emmanuel, and so I wanted to share with you how walking in the light has been a blessing and an encouragement to me in a recent difficulty. Um, right, right around the start of this year, I found myself um, inexplicably just under a darkness, uh, an uncertainty, sort of an oppressive uncertainty about the, the things I just normally believe. Um, I found myself doubting the promises of God for the glorious future that we as believers, uh, that, that, that's in store for us. Um, couldn't explain why, but I was just under this weight. And I found myself reading Psalm 3, and I came to verse 2, and just felt like it spoke to me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Um, it seemed that the circumstances in my life, certain people in my life, and especially the, the constant cynical critic in my mind was constantly asking me, um, Jason, is there, is there really salvation for you in God? Um, and then one Thursday, a couple weeks ago, I, had, I took my family, my wife and daughter, to our small group, uh, our Emmanuel small group. We go every Thursday night. We meet in a member's home. We share dinner together. We open the Bible, and then we pray for one another. And the way our group leader, John, um, takes 1 John 1-7 seriously is he sets aside the last 20 minutes of every group meeting to pick one family or individual and ask them, how are you doing? What, what sins are you dealing with right now? What trials are you dealing with right now? How can we serve you and how can we pray for you? And I just told them everything I just told you guys in more detail. I confessed the, the state of my heart and we stopped everything and every member of that group, one by one, prayed for me. Um, and I felt this deep sense of Christian fellowship. I felt my heart lighten um, as my brothers and sisters bore the weight of my unbelief um, before my Heavenly Father. And the next day as I read Psalm 3 again, I got to verse 3 and 4, and that's what connected with me now. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. The Lord answered me. Um, I can say that. And so as I've prepared to be with you this week, that's been um, my prayer for us, for all of you, for me, that we would take whatever, whatever shame, whatever sin, whatever unbelief, whatever darkness we're facing, confess it to one another, um, lift it before the Lord, cry aloud to the Lord, and believe that he will answer us. He will. He is our shield. Um, so can I just pray for all of us now? Um, Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Um, we, bring, we bring nothing to you um, of any worth. What we bring to you today is our half-hearted belief, our half-hearted affections for you, our sins, our shame, our guilt, and we turn it over to you, believing that you will answer us, that you will answer us with grace and with mercy, that you will reach down um, with the gentle hand of a loving Father and lift our heads towards you, that our eyes would meet yours, and that we would feel your care, your compassion, your love today um, in answer to our aching hearts. And we, we bring all this before you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Who else knows what's really going on inside you? Who else knows what you're really facing? Who else in this student body, among the people you know, is aware of how you're not doing well? God does not want you to go it alone. He has located you here in this precious community the student body of Wheaton College, for you to drop all pretense. 
become vulnerable and walk in the light together. The gospel always creates a community where we let our guard down in appropriate ways and we start discovering how much we have in common both in our struggles and in our Savior and we get traction for newness of life. In other words, gospel doctrine creates gospel culture. The doctrine of grace creates a culture of grace where we sinners get our lives back. Because we're stumbling, but we're stumbling forward into fellowship and cleansing. Some of us grew up in homes, maybe even in churches, where nobody talked. Nobody owned up. Nobody admitted weakness and failure. Some of us, to this day, feel isolated. Maybe even at this moment. And if that's you, it can end here today. Honest community is what Jesus came into this world to create. The Apostle John wrote this wonderful passage late in the first century in the second generation of the early Christian church, and already John is worried. He sees something going wrong. Heresy is polluting the fresh, life-giving environment Jesus had created only decades before. What is heresy? Heresy is worse than a bad idea. Heresy is an idea so bad, it will rob us of God. So if you're a Presbyterian or a Baptist or an Anglican, whatever, your theology might not be perfect, but you can know God through that theology. But the bad idea John is worried about and the practical path it leads to will block out God. Biblical faith is a wide ocean to swim in, but there are shores. And we can't always say, you say tomato and I say tomato. The Apostle John is worried about heresy here in verses 5 through 10. What is the heresy he's concerned about? As we piece it together from these verses, it was the idea that you can become a Christian without changing. You can say you're a Christian and stay the same as you ever were and sin is no big deal and no one should have a problem with that. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So the heresy here is about how we walk, how we live. It's a practical denial of God. How does John respond? Verse 5, this is the message we've heard from Jesus and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That is a fascinating summary of the message of Jesus. Three years of teaching, it doesn't even constitute a complete tweet. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. What does that mean? God is light means many things because light is many things. Light is beautiful, pure, life-giving, cheerful, necessary. There's no such thing as dirty light. There's no such thing as dishonest light. There's no such thing as ugly light. The, and, and best of all, light spreads. Walk into a darkened room, turn on the light switch, poof, the darkness hightails it. Darkness is powerless before light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But us, the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. We all have memories of ugly things we've done that we keep hidden away in the shadows, not just in privacy, but in denial, there are episodes in our past that are so threatening to our sense of ourselves and our self-image, we can't bear to face them. They're so scary. We're like Adam and Eve hiding among the trees of the garden, and God is still asking, where are you? And that impulse to withdraw 
and then to pretend that is the root of this heresy. So each of us must decide, will I be impressive or will I be known? But we can't be both. And Jesus came into this world to lead us into the light of biblical truth and personal vulnerability. We're alone. We can be known to God and to one another. The Bible says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. To whom do you confess your sins? You don't have to bear them alone one moment longer. If we say we have fellowship with the light while we walk in darkness, we today lie and do not practice the truth, but practice an ancient heresy. So, Here's a photograph to illustrate my point. Hmm. What's wrong with that picture? Is the doctrine wrong? No. Jesus really does save. Is the culture wrong? Yes, the culture is so wrong that the doctrine is denied. That church is orthodox on paper and heretical in reality. Thanks, that's all we need for the photograph. <laughs> now, before we get too smug about those people, how are we denying the gospel? There is nothing in Jesus we need to filter out or brace ourselves against or worry about, and there is nothing in us that needs to be protected from his grace. He came into this world so that we sinners can open our hearts and our lives and welcome God with zero caution. That vulnerability that Jesus came down to give us, that is Christianity, where bad people like us who are not in the clan but are caught up in our own crazy can get real with our Lord and with one another and finally start getting free. It's not going to happen in isolation. But it can happen in fellowship because that's where the cleansing blood of Jesus flows. So as, as Jason said, that was wonderful, Jason. Thank you. Verse 7 means a lot to us at Emmanuel. It was sort of... Yesterday, we saw the wardrobe at the Wade Center that was in C.S. Lewis's home. Well, this verse at Emmanuel is our wardrobe into the Narnia of real community. So let's just think about verse 7 briefly, okay? First phrase. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light. I'm so thankful for that. It's just, it's just a walk together, one step at a time. You know, so however stuck you feel, however stuck I feel, here at Wheaton, you have a community surrounding you where you will be loved Love is awaiting you, a community where you will be listened to, where you will be prayed for. And because this is a walk, it isn't an occasional moment. We share together in the Lord a total lifestyle of honesty with him and one another as we journey toward heaven. Now is your time for this generation of the student body of Wheaton College to enter by faith in Christ into friendships of such solidarity that you will still be friends, supporting one another, praying for one another 50 years from now, and it starts today. The way is open for you, every one of you. Walking in the light is when we stop lying, as the passage says. 
We stop needing to appear better than we really are. It's an honest relationship with Jesus and one another so that we're free to grow. And, the, and this whole community walking together in the light, oh, the joy is beyond description. That sacred evening here, when Janie and I were students, God touched us that night, and students were standing at this mic with no pride, no false front, no manipulation, no demandingness. We had nothing but need held out before Jesus and one another with open hands, and the, the tone of the whole campus changed. The difference was obvious. We moved from guardedness and aloofness, and we crossed a line into openness and tenderness. You can have that today. Jesus isn't hiding. We're the ones who hide. He is standing immediately before you now in the obvious place. He is standing at the intersection of biblical truth and personal honesty, and he is inviting the students of Wheaton College to decide today, that's our new address. That's how we roll. When we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we experience two glorious powers that Jesus came and lived and died and rose again to give us. There's nothing in this world like this. Jesus did not come to create a new community. He came to create a new kind of community where these two things happen. One, we have fellowship with one another. The walls fall down, and we discover one another at a deeper level, and it only takes one person in a conversation to get the fellowship going, and the sympathy flows back and forth. And you know what it's like when you're, you're with friends, maybe sharing a meal, and everything is fun and pleasant, but then someone has the courage to get real, one person in that circle, and immediately everybody around that table senses, oh, we just stepped into a new reality here, new ground rules, and everybody opens up. That's fellowship. In 1738, John Wesley and Peter Bowler were sort of drawing up the ground rules for the small groups in the early Methodist movement. Here's ground rule number 10. Everyone in this small group, everyone in order, may speak as freely, plainly, and concisely as he can the real state of his heart. With his several temptations and deliverances, since the last time of meeting. Every week, catch up. The real state of our hearts. That is non-heretical, authentic Christianity that Christ considers Christian. And you can have it here. This is what God wants for you, freely and fully. Who would settle for anything less? Second power, we not only have fellowship with one another, but secondly, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I'm really struck by that. I'm struck by the sequence. If I had written this verse, I would have written, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, and we have fellowship with one another. I would have thought, okay, I need to get clean first, then I enter into fellowship. It's not what the Bible says. It's in the fellowship that we discover the cleansing. We are more than a human support group. We're not less, but we're more. As we walk in the light together in fellowship, the cleansing blood of Jesus comes down, and forgiveness starts feeling real. And how wonderful it is at the end of the verse, he cleanses us from all sin. You are not such a spectacular sinner that your worst sin might defeat his sacred blood. That has never happened in human history. You will not be the first exception. You will never embarrass the Savior of the world. He is not intimidated by your life. All he feels toward you is tenderness. And that sin in your life 
that makes you the most sad and haunts you and shames you and it feels like it damns you, that place of your worst failure and sorrow is where Jesus loves you the most tenderly. It was for that sin that Jesus opened his veins. And why not confess it to him? Just pour it out to him and to a trusted friend who will pray for you. Bear that burden with you. We don't conquer our sins by heroic willpower. We confess our sins of death. Real Christianity is the doctrine of grace in a culture of grace right here on this campus. When we come together and we get clean again, it feels so good to get clean. And you can have it today as soon as this chapel service is over with someone else here in this room. You don't have to start out as lifelong friends. You have Jesus and you have brokenness. That's enough to get going. When this is over, why not go find somebody here and open up? Men with men, women with women, be wise. But if you will walk in the light together, you will break through to a fellowship you've never experienced before, and the cleansing blood of Jesus will flow in your relationships on this campus. And 50 years from now, you're going to remember these days because Jesus was here. Go get it. <laughs>